Hi, everybody. Um, we're going to wait another minute or so just for some folks to join the webinar from the waiting room. Great, it looks like we're starting to slow down a little bit in terms of people entering the, entering the waiting room. We'll just give it another minute or so. Hello, everybody, thank you for joining us. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to the latest in our kind of occasional series of institutional case study webinars at the Center for Open Science. Um, my name is Gretchen Giggin. I'm the Member Experience Manager at COS, and I'm just going to kind of get us started, and then I'm going to disappear and leave it to our wonderful guests today. Um, so today we are talking with folks from, the, from Florida State University and the University of Cincinnati about how they built successful open science communities of practice. Um, and our two moderators today are Center for Open Science uh, staff who I will just hand it off to them and let them take over and uh, they will see you through the rest of the session. So thank you so much for being here. And I'll hand it off to Crystal Lergazem. Yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. I'm Crystal stelton I'm the Training and Education Manager at the Center for Open Science. And Gizem? Hi, everyone. I'm Gizem Solmazrat staff I am a Senior Project Coordinator in the Research Team at the Center for Open Science. Very happy to be here. Awesome. And we're so today what we're going to do is we've got some pre prepared questions that we'll ask. Um, Jazem and I are going to, you know, kind of trade off and asking these questions to our panelists. We'll also allow them with the first question to introduce themselves um, a bit about their roles in their in their own universities. If folks in the chat want to share any um, any experiences or any resources or if you want to say where you're coming in from today, um, feel free to um, post that. Um, but if you have any questions for the panelists themselves, um, we would really love if you can use the Q&A uh, function at the bottom. Of, it's usually at the bottom of the screen uh, in Zoom, um, and that helps um, keep us organized um, so that we can ask your questions to the panelists as well. Um, so with that, um, I'll go ahead and pass it off and uh, we'll get started. We're really excited for today. All right, so should I start with the first question? All right, so our first question to our panelists will be uh, asking about their open science community of practice at their institution. Like we would like to hear about how it started, what were your initial goals or like where are you at right now? And I don't know who wants to jump in first. Uh, Carrie, I, mean, I, yeah. I can start if you like. I'm Carrie Roundtree, and I'm an assistant professor in communication sciences and disorders at the College of Allied Health at the University of Cincinnati. And um, last year, our open our open science community of practice is is very very new. Uh, last year, a team of us wrote a, in Allied Health wrote a faculty development grant. Um, to propose open science um, edu education and practice within our college to just kind of coalesce into um, a community of practice. That grant was funded through the provost office. And so we got to partner with COS to bring that education um, to our college with a plan for the community of practice to be developed out of those um, attendees and for a replication plan to happen in um, another college. So we also had a member of another college um, in our, what we called our open science ambassador team. Um, so where we're at right now is, is those trainings have taken place and we've also um, worked over the summer to have some um, asynchronous training modules that can be accessed by our college or be, um, 
used as part of curriculum for PhD students, for instance, um, so that people can kind of catch up if they weren't able to come to the trainings. And um, we're moving now into monthly meetings for problem solving and application. So taking kind of dilemmas of researchers and trying to use tools um, that open science principles lends to us to solve those dilemmas. So we want the community of practice to be kind of this application lab and um, assessing our immediate issues as researchers, clinicians, and educators, because we are all three in our college and seeing what is one thing, for instance, um, that uh, one way to make your work more open or one way to use a framework to apply to your work that would help you. And we're also hoping to document those meetings for, um, you know, future study or replication and also for the participants to be able to go back and see, see what we did. So that's kind of where we're at still um, very early and uh, we're aiming for monthly meetings that will be pretty well attended um, as we go. Thank you, Carrie. Andrea, do you have anything to add what Carrie said? Yeah, I think I'll just add one thing that um, I think Carrie highlighted and I'll just kind of draw it to folks' attention a little more too. And so my name is Andrea Ford and I'm in the same department as Carrie um, in the Communication Sciences and Disorders Department. And I think what was kind of the cool way that this started for us was that Carrie and I were both interested in open science and we had sort of gotten our feet wet a little bit and were interested in dabbling in it and, and learning more about it. And it was sort of serendipitous that at the same time this grant came along that was a faculty development grant. And so, you know, as people are thinking about creating these community of practices or, you know, um, even if you're just trying to sustain it, finding people who I think for us were like-minded and wanted to learn more about this. We were sort of, I would say the early adopters when you think about like implementation kind of work that we were really like excited in jazz. And, and I know we'll talk about some of the challenges and, and things that we have, but I think finding kind of a buddy that you feel like is somebody that you could maybe chase after some of these grants to fund the work or bring in, like Carrie said, we brought in some training that we wanted to do first to kind of jumpstart us into that community of practice. But I think finding those things that just happen, you know, we were sort of lucky in some ways with the timing, but I think for both of us, I would say we are really invested in this and we are invested in bringing our students along in this with us. So both of us teach a, a topics course that we built, um, you know, students could go to the trainings then as well. And then we're hoping that they'll also come to the community of practice. So I think, you know, as faculty thinking broadly, even bigger than that of who are your students, who are the doc students, the postdocs that might also want to participate or staff, research staff that you have. So um, otherwise, I think Carrie did an awesome job kind of describing we're in our infancy and <laughs> we're kind of learning as we go. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. And I can tell like from my personal experience, I completely agree with you. In fact, that's how I met with Cassidy and Camille like at FSU because I was looking for people who will, who are as passionate as about me. That being said, I would like to give the stage to Cassidy and Camille. I don't know who wants to go first. Um, I can jump in. Uh, so yeah, we had um, a similar goal in wanting to kind of have a application space where people could um, meet other people and um, get some, you know, hands-on um, practice and like build confidence with new practices. Uh, really, it was inspired, uh, at least our community was inspired by um, some other initiatives at other universities, um, like UW-Madison, um, Wisconsin, um, NC State, uh, the UTREC uh, Open Science Community as well. They have a really great toolkit. Um, but just in, initially when I was thinking about kind of starting things at Florida State, it was coming from a place of like being tired of going into departments uh, or even doing like open access week events and things like that, that were just these one-time events. Um, and then I would you know maybe see some more engagement with services, but not really know if people um, we're getting a lot out of it. It was very one way, right? Um, like I would kind of come in and do a presentation and then 
hope for the best. <laughs> but it was really, you know, but when I would go and talk to other advocates or like other people who are very, you know, passionate, like Gazem said, about open, um, there wasn't really a place for them to go or to continue the conversation. So the goal was to really have foster these like ongoing discussions. Um, and I and I'd noticed over the years that there's like a disconnect between people hearing about open science and liking the idea of it or, you know, having a lot of questions about it and then actually feeling confident to apply that to their current work or just kind of transition from um, previous practices to some of these like emerging practices uh, and also to, to build relationships and build community. And I knew that that would take time, um, building those kind of relationships in communities like takes time. So I was looking at it um, over a long term. Uh, and then we uh, we started with virtual meetings um, during the pandemic, which at first we weren't sure if that was going to hurt things or help things when we were getting started. But I think it was helpful, um, particularly at that time. But in general, it's like really hard. Our, our main audience is like faculty and grad students. And like it's really hard to get um, people with busy schedules like that in the same room or um, like on our campus. Sometimes the buildings are really far apart <laughs> from each other. Um, and so that's how we got started. Uh, and then we had a new role with um, Cassie coming in as our open science librarian um, and kind of convening like a um, task force of people within the library and um, elsewhere on campus. Um, we had some like postdocs and grad students um, earlier in that group who were very interested. Uh, and we definitely wanted, you know, this to be like a campus-wide community, not just oh, hey, the library is doing a workshop or something. Um, and so that would, now we're really looking at uh, increasing membership uh, since it's been kind of a long-term thing, like attendance fluctuates, like we're finding that like needs change, um, like initially it was kind of about getting people together, but now we're really trying to zero in on like, what are what are these dilemmas? Um, like Harry and Andrew were saying uh, that, people actually need addressed. Um, so yeah, Cassie, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add. Uh, also, Camille, if you would like to introduce yourself really quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Camille uh, Thomas. I'm the scholarly communications librarian at Florida State University. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Cassie Hoff Mahoney. I'm the open science librarian at FSU. And uh, I don't really have anything to add. I'll just uh, highlight that. Um, so our specific community of practice project, the Open Scholars Project, um, was started a year or two before I got to FSU. Um, so Camille is the one that started it along with some other of our colleagues within FSU. And then I came along about two years ago um, as the open science librarian. And since then we've sort of worked together on both the open so scholars project community aspect and then some other uh, open science initiatives within FSU. Thank you, Cassidy. Before we transition, oh, okay. Carrie already answering the question and answers. I feel like I will leave it to there and I, I did that and then the question disappeared. So I don't, I want it not to get it, lost. No, I should, no. probably shouldn't have done that. No, no, <laughs> you, uh, it is still there. It is under the answered section. Oh, so okay. You, yeah, yeah, it is still there. But does that mean that someone else can answer it too? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, multiple yeah. people um, can answer it. Um, but yeah, we can um, ask. So a couple of you did talk about like community or conversations that are happening in, in your different communities. And um, that some of that, you know, started online, right, during the pandemic. Um, and it, the folks at University of Cincinnati, you guys are using Microsoft Teams as a place to, like, host these conversations. Uh, maybe just really quickly, where where are you guys having uh, your conversations? Are they in person, online? Are they structured meetings, unstructured meetings? How, how did these conversations happen on your campuses? Uh, so at FSU, we um, mainly do virtual meetings. Um, we have uh, one semester we did do hybrid meetings um, for our sort of monthly meetings, uh, but we found um, the hybrid meetings were sort of more complicated than they were worth. 
And it's with hybrid meetings, it's really hard to um, make the in-person and the virtual people feel as um, involved as each other. Uh, so after that, we went back to mainly virtual meetings. Um, we did hold a mostly in-person uh, symposium in the fall of 2023. Uh, so that was really great, but we also, um, the planning of that sort of led to um, a drop off in our monthly meetings, which uh, led to sort of um, attendance drop off with meetings. So uh, yes, but that was in person. And then we also do try to have um, each semester in person uh, get togethers for uh, members of the community. Um, but I would say mostly our conversations are happening online, often on Zoom. And I would say at UC, so we're we're sort of just developing ours right now and haven't actually had our first meeting. It's coming up shortly. But what we've done is we actually um, polled and got some feedback from those who are interested in the, the community of practice. And we asked some pretty straightforward questions sort of at the end of the trainings that we did with Crystal and, and asked, you know, what, how often do you want to meet? What do you want to talk about? Um, how would you like to meet? And I think from that, we've really determined that virtual is the way to go. Um, and so we're going to host things virtually because we do have several faculty that um, are also remote. And so they want to be able to participate too. Um, and Cassidy, I love what you're saying. The hybrid is hard. <laughs> we did that with the trainings and it just gets kind of tricky. Um, so I think that's a real benefit. But I also want to say like, we're also taking notes at what you guys are finding is working. And I love the idea of having at least once a semester maybe where we can kind of come together in person as sort of a kickoff. And, and that may be what we decide to do. But I would say for us, the most important thing was making it feasible for folks that were going to come. And so really finding out what they wanted is how we're sort of designing it because we feel like we'll get better buy-in um, and actually hopefully getting people attending. And Carrie, I don't know if you have anything else to add. I just, all of that. And just one thing that I would add is we also um, opened this. We tried, we tried to keep it our college only at first. But if you were a direct collaborator of someone who is coming to the trainings or coming to the workshops or, or coming or someone on the grant, then we were opening it to those people too, which means that we were opening it to people, you know, that were distant from the university. So um, we had a lot of our meetings in person. We'll probably continue to do that occasionally with the community practice, but it was hybrid. Um, I think that there's pros and cons to hybrid meetings. Personally, I, I prefer either online or all in person, but every once in a while, um, it, it makes sense to have some hybrid meetings. And then, of course, the comings and goings of those of us who are in the building, we do um, have some communication with each other on these subjects and in our service work, um, for example, with the interdisciplinary research committee that a couple of us on the grant are also in that committee. Um, so, th so some things kind of, kind of, um, overlap a little bit, which is always nice because you get more efficient, um, more efficiency in your work, so. And I, I think this actually leads really well into the question that I was going to ask, which is, you know, I'm hearing this about community feedback and, and making sure that you're hearing from folks about what they want and what they need and how they want to interact with this community of practice. Um, sustainability is, is such a key concern in, in keeping communities active and, and alive and healthy. Um, and so for for the four of you um, or whoever of you would like to respond, um, what are some of the most important aspects that you've had been thinking about as you've been talking about sustainability um, that you want to be paying attention to at this point in, in the development of your communities? And, and what plans do you have to address any concerns that come up? And start off. Um, I think that just creating a culture of well, kind of knowing what are what are the currencies of the people in your community of practice. So, how many people are early career folks? How many people are um, 
you know, having um, community-based research, and so they're out of the building more often. How, how many people are already have something um, readily available on um, OSF Home or some in some other repository? Where, where are people in their journey in wanting to engage in open science principles? Um, and then also just creating, a, I really believe in creating a culture of checking things off your list in any group that you're available or that you're involved in. So I personally don't want to go to a meeting to get things added to my to-do list. I want to go to a meeting to get things checked off my to-do list. So that's a, a culture that we've talked about creating in our community of practice is come here and we're going to get something done. We're going to talk about something real quick and then we're going to work together on whatever the next thing is that's kind of um, that you need to hack out or something that you need a workflow for that you can borrow or know how to search places to get that workflow so that you're not trying to recreate the wheel. Just kind of allowing people to leave those meetings with less on their to-do list rather than more, I think would be a would be why I would keep coming back, which is why I want to create this culture, so. And I, I think I love that, Carrie, because I think I've been in meetings with Carrie and this is how they operate and it's fabulous. And I think that's one of the big things that we've taken away is, and, and I'm sure a lot of people on this call know, but attending a workshop is great, but often, you know, we get excited for a week or a couple of days, and then we just get back into our normal habits. And I think that's the beauty of these communities of practice is that we're actually trying to build sort of the action within that so that it becomes more sustained. And so I think the part that we're really excited about is actually the doing is the, you know, we'll have sort of a topic and then working through together, recognizing people might be in different stages, but thinking about how, you know, we might be able to help each other from lessons learned from somebody who's done it or somebody who's struggling, you know, whether it's something around the IRB, how do I write this consent form if I want to be able to share this data or how do I pre-register? Um, like we just talked with Crystal about a mixed methods kind of thing. There isn't a template, but how do I, how do I work through that? And I'm hoping that by building a community where we, we are really open to getting people's feedback that it's not driven by like what carrier I think is important, but really driven by the needs of that community that people see the value for them and see the benefit. I think also this gets tricky and we will probably talk about this, but a lot of times when you're early career, things like you know, sharing your data openly isn't necessarily part of the tenure process. And so, you know, I think that's a challenge we're going to have to come up against is getting people to recognize the value of this while we're still working through how do we get others to see the value of this. So um, just kind of another another thing to be thinking about as I, I saw someone question about some of the challenges that might might happen. Uh, yeah, I think uh... At FSU, probably our biggest concern with sustainability is definitely continued attendance and involvement in our community events. Um, I, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, in the fall of 2023, we had um, a symposium uh, as sort of a way to celebrate the year of 2023 being the year of open science. Um, but with that symposium, uh, we did take uh, I believe a semester off with our monthly meetings in order to prepare for the symposium. And I think some of that, we think some of that sort of halted um, some of the momentum we had with our monthly meetings. Uh, so part of what we're doing right now is trying to sort of build back up attendance and membership. Uh, and part of what we're doing with that is some community research to assess uh, what people actually want from our community. Um, so like you all were talking about, what do our members actually want and need um, from this community of practice that we have created? Um, so that's something that we're working on this semester. We have, you know, lists of members that we are in the process of contacting. Um, and I really love what uh, you said, Carrie, about the creating a culture of getting something off your checklist. Uh, I think Camille and I may steal that for <laughs> some of our meetings, but yeah, that was a really interesting concept. 
Yeah, I would just, um, that is our, our biggest concern with sustainability. I would just add like, I think it is the checklist thing and that um, deeper engagement and wanting to um, have our community members um, take up more of the mantle, like to make it more of their own. I think there's still um, uh, like a lot being driven by the kind of um, working group that works on it, uh, where we would love to see more uh, participation, participation from the members um, and kind of like checking things off their checklist, uh, but making the community like their own. Thank you, Camille. So I guess then I will continue with the next question. I don't know if you see anything, Crystal, in the chat question and answer related to this. I don't either. So our third question will be um, converting a researcher into an open science practitioner and advocate can involve some potential risks. So how do you deal with difficult questions in your communities about the difficulties or challenges in adopting open science practices? Uh, or like, how do you deal with balancing honesty with the risk of turning off potential open science advocates? Um, I guess specific example would be from my personal experience, like, is that when we started using open science practices, I was like always complaining about like, this is taking so much time. Like this is a very long process. So we are very curious about like how you are dealing with these kind of questions in your communities. Um, I'll start off on this one. Um, I'm a fan of like letting people talk about their concerns and addressing their concerns, like having very open uh, like conversations about it and for people to ask critical questions like that because that it's those are common. I find that they are common concerns and common pain points. Um, and sometimes there's not a great solution to it. Um, something that's been really cool with the Open Scholars Project is seeing people from other different departments and dis different disciplines say like, oh, well, this is how I do that. Or, you know, I use this tool. And it's just, um, that's one of the main goals of having this kind of community practice is so that people can kind of sh compare notes um, or share like information that um, they may not have had otherwise or, um, you know, we have a lot of resources we can provide or report people to as a library, but um, we're not in the labs or in, you know, we're not the ones actively on these projects. Um, and so how the process or those workflows look um, can be, you know, something that researchers can speak to with each other better than we could. Um, and I think part of the goal is to co-create solutions, um, either like at FSU or um, in larger collaborations, like we're part of um, the Helios open group uh, with other institutions uh, where sometimes it's, we can highlight uh, what each stakeholder can do in their role um, and share like different approaches because it's not, all, I think sometimes two people are trying to solve this problem a lot. And that's one of the huge like things we can harness with open is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel and we can kind of actively share. Um, templates and solutions and um, different tools. Uh, and I think sometimes that is an adjustment for people. Like there's, um, it, there are a lot of silos and I think that the, there's this idea that like we have to solve things um, or sometimes it's an expectation of like that it will be faster um, or, you know, this, we have to use this kind of system to do that um, when maybe there is a, a different way to do it. But I'm a big fan of just people talking openly about those concerns so that we can actually address them. I think in the like earlier kind of workshop only approach, um, there's a lot of like wanting to step in and say, no, like open science is great and it's so fast, just like these other things. And like sometimes that's just not the case. And um, what really needs to happen is something better needs to be kind of created or um you know, for us to compare notes uh, rather than to kind of try to say that something is not a problem if it is a problem for people. And 
I would just jump in and um, Andrea and I gave a presentation last night on this subject to a bunch of PhD students and Andrea probably was going to say this, but I'm going to say it for her. But um, she, she used this analogy of kind of a buffet and said, here are all the things that we can do. If your project would benefit from this workflow or that open science principle or pre-registration or, you know, posting your data or revising your naming convention or um, doing a read me thought, whatever it is, you know, that makes sense to you and in the project life cycle that you're in right now, if you've never dabbled in open science principles, then like, let's give you an overview and, and let me just let's talk about it and come to our working, come to our community of practice and let's, let's see if we can hash it out or see if there's a number of other people who are struggling with their naming conventions or something like that. And they might meet you there at that community of practice. And then you all can all leave with your naming conventions in hand and you're one step closer to your project and being very organized. So, uh, so I think that, if there are skeptics or if there are uh, even naysayers, if there's one thing that's valuable to them, a way that they can engage, then perhaps they start to see the value and that they can talk about how, you know, their mind was changed on that one thing. And that's fine. You know, um, you don't have to be, uh, we, our grants team, we started calling each other, our, our team, we we wrote our team as open science ambassadors, right? So we're going to carry this from education to community practice to replication and all of that. But you don't have to be an ambassador. You don't have to be, you know, proselytizing the world on open science. You could look for one open science principle that works for you that, that you want to functionally apply in your, um, in your, world, whether it's an academic world or an industry world or a teaching world or anything like that. So we've we've kind of talked about it in that way. I, I love that, Carrie. And I think the other thing, just to piggyback off, Camille, what you were saying is I think just having those open discussions too, I agree. We, you know, we had people that would come to the trainings and just feel like it was just another thing that they had to do on their to-do list, or they had concerns about scooping, or they had concerns about just the amount of time it would take, or that they have already got these established practices. And so I think it really is talking about those concerns and figuring out what is behind them. Because if we can kind of figure out why you're concerned, then I can kind of work with you. Um, and I tend to be like a rose colored glasses of like, let's just do it. Like, let's figure it out. This is so exciting. Like you're going to be totally fine where I have to recognize that everybody is as enthusiastic as Carrie and I are about this. And so I think, you know, taking the time to acknowledge, and for me, it was really taking a step back to say, you're right. There are challenges in this. This is going to add time. I'm in a different stage in my career or my content is different. I don't have to worry about as much of the IRB kinds of concerns that you might have. And so I do think just having those building time in to maybe talk about those concerns. But as Carrie and I have talked about, we want it to be um, action planning. So let's talk about those concerns, but then let's figure out some way that it feels reasonable for you to try these kinds of things. You know, we want people, while it's great to have a community of practice where everybody is really excited about it, we also want the people who want to just like, who are skeptical, because if we can get them in and we can build that buy-in, then we might just entice them enough that they might find the value. And those are the people I think we want to try to reach to. Um, I think as we start it, we're probably going to get the most enthusiastic <laughs> people. But I think as I think about long-term and sustainability, it's getting more people involved. And, and that just has sort of a cascading effect too. And I would just add that we have to remember that with everything, there's kind of this spectrum of like types of adopters with any new technology, any new workflow, like Andrea is definitely like that. I'm the early adopter. I'm going to just look at it and be like, yes, yes, I can do this. I'm actually like not on that end of the scale, I don't think. But, and then we have people who are like, they want to see it proven in several different circumstances. And, and then they might think about it, you know, and, and it's the same thing, like, 
when your university transitions from or your your teaching transitions from blackboard to canvas there's like whoa no you know this whole thing and then you have some early adopters and then you have the people who hate it and wish that we would go back to blackboard even though we've had canvas for you know eight years or something you know there, there's all along the spectrum so we have to acknowledge that People are people. They're always going to be people about everything. This is not open science specific. This is not open science practice specific. This is kind of people specific. And, and we're, we're, um, we're suggesting some new ways to do things. Yeah, those are really helpful thoughts. I think especially, I mean, at, at costs even, we've got our own spectrum, even of, of folks that are, you know, within the organization about which practices they care about most and to what extent they think certain practices are useful or not useful. So even if you have a community full of really enthusiastic people about any particular uh, sort of thing, whether that's open science or open scholarship or something else, right? Like you do still have a, uh, hopefully a diversity of, of opinions and, and viewpoints within that group. So it's important to, to surface that and have those conversations. Um, and I think that that can lead right to this idea of having this active community that is, that hopefully is everybody's long-term goal, right? Um, and so, um, you guys have mentioned that there are some things that you've done as, you know, like one-time events or like special initiatives, like the trainings um, or the symposiums. Um, but you guys also have both worked on, on longer term plans. So what are some of those crucial first steps in the process that can lead to some, some quick wins, some small wins, some, some immediate benefits? And how do you balance those quick wins with those longer term goals of maybe you want your department to, um, be posting preprints more often or something like that. Um, how do you balance those those quick wins with the longer term goals? Uh, I'll jump in. Uh, so I would say regular meetings and consistent programming. Um, we found that to be helpful um and that gives us a, and i think that's some that's one goal um with thinking about a community practice in the long term is um having some aspects that are consistent um that helps us to organize um you know the meetings and like be able to promote it uh to point people somewhere so if we do you know go out and talk to a department or um, there's some kind of event, we can then say, oh, if you're interested, like we're having a meeting next month. Um, there's somewhere to point people uh, on a regular basis, but it also gives us um, like, so one of the goals too was to not put a lot of labor into these one-time things. Um, so like having something consistent allows us to um, plan, but also to uh, like, do this kind of community research that we want to go and do and find out more about people's needs and their goals um, because we've already we're you know getting ready to set the schedule for the spring semester um, so it kind of allows us to host the events and um, some of our other initiatives but also to do to get that feedback um, and to con continue to improve it um, and that kind of community building that that deeper engagement that ongoing assessment um also takes time but we don't want that we don't want that to take away from the from the meetings that people can go to um and like being able to come kind of at any time and, and get resources or talk to other people uh but we also don't want like planning the events themselves to take away from like the deeper engagement work um and that's kind of what we were talking about before with like when we did take this semester off to plan a symposium it changed the momentum because it took so much more time and effort to plan this kind of bigger event um, than like it does for our regular meetings at times. Um, there's still effort there, but it's because it's ongoing, um, you know, we can kind of learn and adapt as we get more information or we can, you know, learn that, you know, from one discussion, that's happened a lot too, where in, a, in one discussion or in one meeting, um, someone will bring up a topic or a question. Um, and then because we're gonna have, you know, we know we're gonna have another meeting, we can say, oh yeah, let's talk more about that. Um, let's, you know, dedicate time to build upon it. Like, 
um, we actually had, we have a lot of people who are interested in open data and we, you know, saw a great interest in it and said, okay, we got to have more meetings about this. We definitely weren't done in that, in that first meeting um, talking about this and there, we're realizing there's a lot of needs there. Um, so I think that, uh, at least our biggest problem with that um, right now is like, uh, oh, I guess our, our bigger, our kind of problem, our biggest problem when it comes to um, trying to balance the uh, and the long term plans for the community and like the immediate of like, okay, this event is next month, um, is uh, trying to find like appropriate metrics and communicating that deeper impact because this does look really different from um, one off events where like a lot of the assessment is on attendance, um, which matters. And like we said, like um, that's a growing attendance and membership and engagement is uh, like our biggest focal point right now. Uh, but a uh, community of practice we're finding is like a very, we're looking, uh, the, often the goal is for deeper engagement. It's not just how many people are there or, um, you know, right after that, what are, you know, are, are more people using, you know, the tools and platforms that we offer through our institution. Um, we are finding, we're trying to find the most appropriate metrics to measure something like deeper engagement or like if people are, you know, checking off that they went back. Uh, and you know, started using these practices, uh, and that can take a long time. Going back to like their their research projects and their team, um, and that's it can be hard to communicate that kind of impact uh, of like what is the group doing and how is that? What are like our targets and our goals? And we're finding like uh, you know we're trying to find the right the most appropriate way to talk about that because um, there's a lot going on besides like just are people attending the events. And um, just really quickly, feeding into the long-term goal part of it, we also are making sure that like the community building aspect of our open science efforts, um, so OSP, the Open Scholars Project, works with the other open science groups that we have at FSU, like the um, internal library task force that works on more services and resources. And then we also have an open access advisory board, which is um, more broader and a lot of uh, people external to the library, where we uh, meet with more like higher up people in the university um, with talks about like advocacy for open science practices. And all three of the groups sort of feed into each other with our longer term goals of um, increasing open research practices at FSU. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna say, um, we're finding like those groups do go hand in hand and that a lot of our, a lot of the other efforts are, uh, we've noticed are like focused on building awareness. Whereas I think with the community of practice, we're building that, we're looking to have that um, deeper engagement and like more hands-on programming um, so people can, you know, learn these tools and um, practices. One of the things that I I, um, I got to go to a workshop in D.C. recently and, and some of the advice that I was given about specifically about open science community of practice from Greg Tannenbaum was you have to think about what do people want to walk away with. Um, so when you're thinking about long and short term goals, you're thinking about that meeting, but also the thread that runs through that person's story um, that goes meeting to meeting. They've, you know, gotten to this place and that place, and then they went, maybe they went somewhere else and, and scooped up a little um, knowledge in a different community, like they came to this webinar or something, came back to their community practice. But what's the story? What's their story of what they've done? How does it align with um, the research and the scholarly activity that they have had? And I don't mean just publications, but things that they've made available, um, uh, different um, tools that they've engaged in, um, different um, places that they've looked for the um, items that they needed for, th for their research agenda. And so kind of just pulling back and going macro and then pulling and 
going back into the meeting and saying, how can we help you take a step um, in your journey is is really important. But building those stories, and I think um, that's hopefully something that's going to um, occur naturally. But I do think that the encouragement that I got from Greg was to make sure that you have people in your group that are intentional about that goal that you have. So our core group, just knowing that these are the kind of things that we're looking for and, and, and kind of being advocates for those goals, whether implicitly or explicitly in our communities um, is a good thing too. And one other thing just to add for folks to think about too, I think as I think about the kind of the first steps, and I think this relates to sustainability as well, but when we formed this grant and we formed our initial kind of ambassador team, we made sure to include the librarian um, in within our team. And I think what has been very cool is that has kind of cascaded into us bringing another librarian in at the broader university level who works with our research and data services. I think she might even be on the call. Um, and so I, I think that thinking about those as, as you build these communities and you're thinking about sustaining and Cassidy and Camille are wonderful because they already are the librarians. So <laughs> we've got, they've got that benefit. But if, for, for groups that are a little bit um, you know, maybe it's faculty that are starting or staff, like getting connected with those folks so that you can broaden that reach. I just feel like the information that they've given us and the things that we didn't even know was going on. And I apologize, Amy, but I, we get a ton of emails and sometimes you, you just don't, you can't read them all. And so she actually reached out to us and was like, we're doing this cool thing. And like, we're already doing this. Like, can we connect with you? And we're like, yes, this is what we're looking for. So I think finding across, you know, thinking about, you know, maybe it starts very small, but being very intentional about ensuring that the librarians are part of that and thinking about how you can build that kind of, as you think about the long-term and sustainability, because they're always going to have access to some of the systems and the resources that we may need um, to, to really be able to do a lot of this work too, or can advocate for us as we identify things that we're going to need to carry out this kind of work too. Thank you, Andrea. So for my next question was going to be about uh, cross institutional communications that you have, you all already mentioned, like how you are, you know, connecting with other departments, sometimes with administrations or librarians you are bringing into the group. So since you already touched that, and for the sake of time, I want to bring one of the questions from the chat that Julie asked. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to read, but the short part of it, it says like, I can see how community of practices can help find in, find solutions and tools to improve the workflow, but how do they relate to senior management and top-down policies from university admin? How do your community of practice relate to the high ed managers and decision makers deciding on the formalization of open science and open science practices? So I was wondering if you can a little bit touch to this aspect. Uh, I'll go first and talk just a little bit. Um, so we uh, definitely do, uh, one of the things that we did over the summer was uh, we created a training program um, for open research practices. And we frame the program as uh, training people for the upcoming implementation of the new federal funder open access uh, policies for research that are coming out. Um, at the end of 2025, um, although some funders have already released their new uh, guidelines. So those guidelines from the funders are definitely a sort of top-down um, mandate for research practices. So um, we have used the sort of top-down mandates as a way to actually get people to care about or be involved um, in learning more about the open research practices that come along with those mandates. Um, so it's not that we don't think people don't care about open research or think it's important, but those sort of top-down mandates um, are a way to make people um, sort of that like activation energy of making it so that it's important enough 
um, to people that they want to learn more about the um, open practices that are soon becoming required. Ah, and yes, Carrie, um, we have an OSF page for the training. Um, yes, and we uh, are still working on making the content of the training open, but uh, hopefully in the next few weeks, um, I will get to that and make the um, content from the trainings open as well. Um, yes, and I'll add that, uh... Another way that we've worked with this is um, like the open access advisory board that Cassie mentioned, uh, which is a more formal group. It's not, it's kind of separate from the community of practice aspect, um, but they, we've started working, that group uh, predates the community of, of practice. So we've been working with that group to um, speak with like university administrators um, and found that really helpful um, because a lot of times, you know, in, in our other advocacy work, we would talk to administrators and we talk to like researchers kind of separately. And they're both saying, uh, you know, like, oh, administrators are saying we want to support researchers. We want to do what's going to, you know, help them get promotion and tenure or help them, um, you know, complete their grants um, and comply uh, to like requirements. Uh, and then researchers are kind of saying, well, you know, we want to do what is being required of us. Um, we want to like, you know, meet these expectations. We want to like comply with uh, grants and things like that. Um, and we're looking for this kind of support. Uh, and so the, it was kind of um, like talking about th these two groups talking about each other. <laughs> and so we were able to start having meetings with administrators in the advisory board um, or invite them to the advisory board meetings uh to talk with each other uh and we had a report on the different like open science initiatives um that we had going and what kind of resources we knew people needed uh and we had signatories from the community of practice and from the advisory board um and we sent that to the president uh, we had a new president of the university um come in a couple years ago um we sent that up to the president so um i think that the groups uh, like the the community of practice and the the uh, like the kind of groups that we have with researchers, um, we can utilize to in our advocacy efforts um, to have them sign on or to to voice um, their needs more directly or you know kind of pass along um, those things to administrators, but also allow administrators to be in the room with researchers. So it's not just us. Um, you know, at least as librarians coming and saying like, oh, this is what, you know, needs to happen with open. It's also the researchers saying like, yes, we want this too, or this is the kind of support that we need in order to do this, or the kind of questions that we have um, for administrators. So um, they really, they can go hand in hand. I, I think I just want to, I think this question leads straight has led straight into kind of incentives um, and and what we're doing to build in incentives for people to, <clears throat> excuse me, engage in open science practices. And I want to acknowledge that there's a vast array of, at least in the academy, incentive structures out there from people who will openly say, uh, you're never going to get tenure if you if you're you know just focusing on this to people who have really transformed their departments to appreciate all and appreciate and incentivize all aspects of the scientific life cycle um and i think that it, we would be remiss if we didn't and this maybe speaks to long-term goals too, because everything is kind of slow to change in the academy, right? But planning incentives for um, communities of practice and different levels, uh, getting ideas from different levels of professors and their thoughts on how to work open science efforts into scholarly activities in our dossiers, um, collecting evidence from outside that bolsters the work that we're doing, even if reviewers 
um, for our promotion and tenure process are unfamiliar. Um, and kind of advocating as a whole for a wider view of what contributions to science really are um, and, and just educating our communities so that they can in turn educate um, their departments and one another. So and, and for us, it's also kind of starting with students. We see big opportunities with students who are gonna form the future of how the departments that they um, are eventually embedded in um, coalesce around these principles, right? Or they're gonna choose their workplaces based on how they can apply these principles maybe too, so. And I know we're wrapping up pretty soon here, but um, just two other things to add. I think that one of the things we did is when we invited our call for attending the trainings and being part of the community of practice, our associate dean of research attended um, many of those trainings. And so I think just by having her in the room and hearing her try to think through and problem solve also helped by the, sort of the buy-in for the rest of us too, that she saw how many people were there and that people were interested in this and they're wanting to do it. And so I think, you know, making them part of those as much, you know, they're busy, I get it, but but the invite, at least putting out a branch to say, come and join us, like, we'd love to have you here, hear what we're talking about, those kinds of things, um, I think are really important. I think the other piece to think about as we think about sort of like top down kinds of things, in addition to grants, is that I've seen more and more, and this might just be in our field in, in speech language pathology, but journals, I'm being asked by reviewers to post my my um, data sharing or, or my protocols or my coding manuals or my data itself. Um, and so I do think that culture is shifting where people are, are really starting to ask for these things and expect it, not only because of grants, because you need to start sharing those things, but also just people being able to access how you set up your experiment or how you set up the coding structure that you used. And so I think that's also a shift that we're starting to see within kind of the more manuscript, the dissemination piece is people starting to ask for these kinds of practices. And, and I, I would hope that that would kind of continue as well. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to all of our participants, all our panelists, and uh, to my COS colleagues for leading us through this discussion. This was really great. Thank you so much for your time. Um, everyone who has registered to attend will receive an email fairly soon, um, and it will include a link to a recording of this. Um, and uh, watch out for our Center for Open Science blog. We'll be uh, posting a, a follow-up as well um, sometime in the, in the coming weeks. So thank you all again. Thank you for attending. Thanks everyone who, who uh, spoke and everyone who attended. Thanks so much. Bye.